thanks to everyone for coming, first of all. And in this panel on yeah, drugs and the politics of um, consumption in Japan, and there's three of us presenting. We'll each speak um, for about 20 minutes, and then we'll just follow that with all of the Q and A afterward. And if you know we have these kind of numbers, then it might just be easiest to do kind of a hand raising thing and just kind of ask questions verbally. Um, and I think um, uh, Nadine, who's doing our tech support, has to move on at the end of this panel. So we'll we'll probably try to finish uh, more or less on time. Um, and so just to give a brief overview of, of this panel here, and this is part of a larger project um, that Judith and Miriam and I are working on. Um, Judith has really been kind of driving force behind this, organizing a conference on drugs and the politics of consumption um, at the University of Zurich in 2019. And kind of following the success of that event, the three of us um, began working on an edited collection that developed um, those papers. And then we, then we initially proposed this kind of volume um, as part of a, a presentation for EAJS or a panel last year. We kind of expected it to be much more of a work in progress, but as it turns out, we've kind of got almost all the final drafts um, and are hoping to send the full volume to readers the next few weeks. So fingers crossed, um, but maybe it'll, it'll appear sometime uh, in a too distant future. But so this, this larger project we're working on examines how the politics of consumption in Japan allow a reevaluation of the boundaries between kind of accepted deviant, licit and illicit in a global historical perspective. So, you know, what political, economic, social and cultural processes shaped particular perceptions of drugs in Japan? You know, what policies and practices make Japan historically comparable or connect Japan to other countries and societies? And by addressing these questions, we hope to show that you know, from the 19th century, um, even before to the present day, Japanese attitudes um, towards drugs have been shaped by a complex interplay of domestic concerns, imperial agendas, and an awareness of emerging international norms. And I mean, the larger volume, and it looks at the history of drugs in Japan from the late medieval period to the present with kind of this focus on consumption. Um, as looking from Buddhist treatments for supposed parasites um, to the early modern drug trade, um, to opium in the late Tokugawa period and beyond. I mean, other studies range from patent medicines in the Meiji period to narcotics in the late imperial period and the U.S. occupation, all the way to glue sniffing in the late 1960s. Um, so the papers the three of us are presenting today draw on our chapters in the volume, and we look forward to any questions and comments you might have at the end. And so without further ado, I'd um, like to introduce um, Judith Dekade, our first presenter at the University of Zurich. Um, and yeah, I'll hand it over to you. So thank you, Oleg, for giving the background to uh, um, our panel today. And I'm, as Oleg said, I'm Judith Vitale from the University of Zurich. And um, I'll focus on a case study, um, which is opium, the history of opium in Japan in the 19th, 20th centuries with a focus on the 1920s and 1930s. Um, I hope I'll be able. Okay. So I hope that works. Um, so let me start. The definition of what drugs are acceptable or unacceptable is partly pharmacological and partly cultural and historical. Opium, the dried sap uh, extracted from poppy seed pods, seed pods, is nowadays considered the archetype of dangerous drugs due to its addictive properties. But this view is relatively new. Only in the 1920s, opium crossed social and legal boundaries, undergoing a transformation from a home remedy and stimulant to a hazard of health and an illegal substance associated with de degeneration and deviance. Reasons are well known. First, criticism of the opium trade in China and subsequent international treaties the so-called opium conventions aiming to regulate the narcotics traffic. Second, shifting consumption patterns that involve new pure drugs and new methods of the administration from eating and smoking opium to the injection of the opium alkaloid morphine and the semi-synthetic derivative heroin. 
third to rise of medical addiction series, and finally prohibitionist tendencies, which reflected the interwar crisis. These developments also affected Japan, but they have not been studied well due to the important place of the leisure of opium smoking in the political and cultural imaginary of the 19th and early 20th centuries, a leisure which was never popular in Japan. The Japanese never smoked um, opium, though um, they described the practice in China as seen in the sketch here, um, published in the Japanese journal in 1929. So my paper is um, not about the hedonistic use of opium in Japan, but the um, use of opiates as medicines. After an overview of the history of opium in the Edo and Meiji periods, I explored the social and legal shifts related to the consumption of opiates in pre-war Japan. Already in the early 18th century, Japanese drug wholesalers traded with domestic and imported opium. Opium was not only used in commercial pills and powders, but also poppy seeds and opium were known as a folk medicine. Here is an early illustration of the poppy seed, seed pod, which stands um, for opium in an encyclopedia of the early 19th century. Um, in contrast to this popular use and consumption of opium, Edo period trained doctors ignored opium due to its low regard in Chinese herbal books. It is with the outbreak of cholera epidemics in the 1850s and 1860s and a concomitant increased interest in Western therapeutics that opium was propagated by Japanese doctors. A woodblock print shows the drugs um, used during the cholera epidemic of 1858, um, opium, I hope you can see where I point to, and the um, opium compounded Hoffman's anod uh, anodyne are among them, oh, here. So these drugs are all Western style drugs, apart from rhubarb, which is in the low right corner. Uh, interestingly, hemp um, is not among the drugs, but among um, Japanese traditional medical rituals here. So 1858, you already have um, the sale of, of op opium and opiate compounded medicines. Ironically, precisely in the same year, 1858, the Tokugawa Bakfu prohibited the import of opium in treaties with Western powers, the Dutch, Russian, and American, um, due to China's fate in the opium wars. Following the example of the Tokugawa Bakfu, the Meiji government issued a prohibition on the import, buying, selling, and consumption of opium suitable for smoking already in 1868. In parallel, however, the Meiji government established a legal frame that guaranteed the regulated supply of medicinal opium. The opium monopoly of the government, which was in effect by 1879, implied the establishment of testing bureaus, the application for permits for the trade in opium, and also a reduction of the sale of opium to clinics and pharmacies only. Also in 1886, the government standardized the formulas for over-the-counter medicines, so-called patent medicines or bayaku in Japanese, while allowing a fixed amount of scheduled poisons such as opiate in these medicines. As a consequence of recurrent cholera epidemics in the early Meiji period, patent medicines compounded with opiates became extremely popular this is suggested by Meiji period advertisements. One example is Shinyaku, literally a medicine of the gods, produced or divine medicine, produced according to the formula of chlorodyne, an English patent medicine um, with a high content of morphine hydrochloride. So among the medicines advertised here in this woodcut of 1877, you see Shinyaku, with, which was compounded with morphine. It is difficult to determine the number of habitual users of opiate compounded medicines in the Meiji period. Although prospect 
prescriptions of Shinyaku indicated five to 20 drops several times a day, like, quote, in the case of morphine, end quote, against all sorts of illnesses such as diarrhea, melancholia, chest, stomach, or toothaches, there was not any specified limit, limit on the period of use. Thus, although cholera paved the way to the success of opiate-based preparations, habitual users were mostly likely patients with chronic pains or illnesses, including women with menstrual problems and tuberculosis patients. Concerns about poisoning cases, though not about the addictive properties of patent medicines, arose in the 1890s in parallel to similar debates in Europe. Japanese newspapers um, referred to suicide by poisonous drugs, deleterious drugs, or morphine. Against this background and following the turn of the century legal reforms in European countries, a new patent medicine law came into effect in 1914. Labels on packages were not to exaggerate the efficacy and had to include precise information on the dosage. One commentary of the 1914 law includes an advertisement of um, such a patent medicine, the Ken Ikotogan, literally pill for the stabilization of the stomach, which was likely also compounded with opiates. Um, uh, and which was promoted against cholera, along with Shinyaku. The commentary arranged in the four corners of the ad um, reads caution, caution to spurious um, articles. Shinyaku continued to be marketed in the early 20th century, but morphine was dropped from its formula by the 1920s. Ironically, precisely when concerns about the misuse of its of opiate-based patent medicines led to legal reforms. The medical profession introduced new, more powerful methods of administration and drugs, namely hypodermic morphine and heroin. Japanese doctors first discussed opiate addiction in medical journals from 1904, agreeing with the year of the Russo-Japanese War, and thus likely the spilling of morphine from the military into civil spheres but only in the 1920s, debates about opium addiction reached the public sphere against the background of international developments. The ratification of the Treaty of Versailles after the First World War implied the agreement of signatory countries to bring the Opium Convention of 1912 into force and thus also obliged Japan to enforce necessary legislation. In 1920, that is immediately after the First World War, the Japanese Home Ministry issued an ordinance about control of morphine, cocaine, and their salts, requiring that the importers and manufacturers, as well as the wholesalers and retailers of morphine, cocaine, and their derivatives keep books to be examined by the government periodically. Moreover, the sale of these drugs was limited to pharmacists and drugstores employing pharmacists. Nevertheless, <clears throat> as visualized in a graph on Japan's domestic and colonial narcotics policies in 1921, though legislation limited the manufacture and distribution of opiates, it hardly affected consumers. So the Hygiene Bureau is the responsible bureau for um, controlling opium and um, you see that opium retailers and doctors, dentists, drug uh, manufacturers are within um, the regulations, but the consumer who would be here is not greatly affected by the, or not affected by the system. Japan's legal stance, however, was not unique. Despite the end of the First World War, Marking a tightening of international narcotics control, only the USA, China, and France criminalized the consumption of opium. In contrast, in Britain, doctors were allowed to maintain patients on morphine or heroin if they could not otherwise function healthily. Um, Germany and Switzerland, belonging to the manufacturing exporting countries, 
and for forced laws that placed the producers and wholesalers of drugs under stricter control, a bit like in Japan in the 1920s. However, quote, from the perspective of the consumer, the law was not a particular incision, unquote. The sale of drugs was limited to pharmacies and there were no explicit restrictions on doctors. In Japan, the legal neglect of the consumer agreed with consistent representation of Japan as a drug-free society. In 1924, Kaku Sagataro, co-head of the Japanese delegation to the Second Opium Convention, the so-called um, Geneva Conference, asserted, fortunately, the Japanese people have, as the result of measures of strict control and of social education, kept themselves entirely free from falling into the drug habit. The comparison was, of course, always uh, with Taiwan and China. Yet, um, statistics submitted by the Japanese government to the League of Nations in 1929 and 1930 suggest a different situation. They indicate that Japan had an average consumption of morphine in international comparison. Uh, this is always the legal consumption, not the illegal one, but was next highest consumer to France in heroin per inhabitant. Japan's consumption of cocaine was also exceptionally high. The consumption of opiates was thus not low in pre-war Japan, and as statistics suggest, opiates were readily available. In 1918, in a companion addressed to young women, to Dr. Sato Toksai warns to use morphine against menstrual pain because the regular use of morphine unavoidably led to the narcotic habit. His warning suggests that in effect, doctors readily described morphine. The essayist Tsuga Chikuho informs us about the sad fate of a girl. A girl of only 16 years has a craving for opiates since she has received narcotic injections against asthma as a child. Although any young girl of her age wishes a kimono, this ill girl is terribly obsessed with narcotics. She stands at the entrance of pharmacies and does not take notice of any other shop fronts. She remembers exactly where what doctor or pharmacy is in town. When she rushes, outside and suddenly wishes an injection, she rushes to any doctor and demands an injection. Young women, however, are not the most mentioned addict type. Doctors define two particular social groups displaying a high rate of addiction. On the one hand, there were medical addicts, often socially well situated and typically agreeing with the doctors themselves. On the other, there were lower class addicts gathering in the big cities. Among these, there were a great number of Koreans who were to be considered non-medical addicts and to be delinquent as a result of their addiction. As stated by the essayist Tsuga, sometimes newspapers supply us with the sad stories, tragic stories and terrible stories of vagrant Koreans. Behind these stories, there always lurks opium or some other dope. Doctors did not necessarily ascribe morphine addiction to a special predisposition, but by the late 1920s, they agreed that morphine addiction caused physical and heavy mental changes. According to them, addicts um, were quickly tired of things, indolent, and did not have any moral sense. To obtain morphine, they forged documents, lied, extorted, and stole. Heavy addicts were unable to lead an ordinary life and became extremely erratic. In the early 1920s, Japanese doctors still eagerly propagated different antidotes against addiction. However, like in Europe and the USA, voices propagating effective cures silence as doctors noticed a high percentage of relapse. To avoid relapse, doctors propagated in-hospital treatment for possibly at least six weeks. Also, the doctors still perceived morphine as indispensable to the modern medical profession. Doctors' caution in dispensing morphine increased. Um, 
This is shown by an inquiry of the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture in 1927. He asked to the hygiene bureau whether refusal of a morphine injection to an addict by a doctor represented a violation of the medical practitioner's law. The inquiry shows that doctors were obviously increasingly reluctant to maintain addicts. In 1930, following the ratification of the Geneva uh, Convention, the narcotics regulation came into effect. This was the first time the words narcotics, mayaku, entered domestic Japanese law. In 1934, the law was revised uh, because apparently there were signs of an increase of addicted patients According to the revision, doctors had the duty to register addicts and prescriptions, treatment facilities were to be established, very addicted patients were to be admitted to mental hospitals for treatment. Thereafter, treatment facilities for addicts rapidly grew. You can read this in Miriam's book, who I now saw joined us. So, um, so these treatment facilities grew in the 1930s, not only university hospitals and private clinics, but also institutions such as the Metropolitan Police Department Tokyo provided facilities. Treatment facilities, especially those of the police, represented a convenient instrument to lock away problematic social groups. Um, the repetition of photographs showing morphine addicts who due to their daily injections had their whole bodies filthy and ulcerous like lepers, established an association between addiction and disease. This association legitimized the physical isolation of the addicts as disease carriers, whereas already before they had been segregated in the metropolitan slums, as shown by this photograph of 1933. And the association here is, of course, with Koreans living in the slums. Ongoing debates at the Hygiene Bureau show that even after prevention measures were introduced in 1934, the number of registered addicts did not decrease. Only with the outbreak of the Sino-Japanese War in 1937, as the military accounted for over 60% of the domestic opiate consumption, the court of medical opiate addicts disappeared from records. Exogenous factors to solve the social problem of addiction, a problem which in the official representation had never really existed in Japan. After the war in Japan, like in the West, public attention shifted from medical addicts to the juvenile delinquent addict type. And Oleg will tell us more about those. So I come to my conclusion. The Japanese government introduced public health policies as part of its modernizing ambitions in the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Yet authorities tolerated the consumption of opiates. As Western modern medicines, opiates were not perceived as conflicting to Forge's model of high productivity, but to the contrary, as a method to suppress dysfunctions such as chronic pains and depression in modern society. Opiate addiction only made career as a social problem in Japan when doctors' increasing concerns about the harm of opiates were reinforced by discourse about Korean lower-class delinquent drug addicts. Only thereafter, the Japanese government undertook efforts to limit the consumption of opiates. Whereas there, whereas there is no doubt that early 20th century international cooperation was directed against illegal drug traffic, the Japanese case allows to question whether a prohibitive drug policy affecting the consumers of narcotics was not the exception rather than the norm in early 20th century industrial nations, which were oriented toward high productivity and mass consumption. Thanks for your attention. Great, no, thank you. Um, and um, yeah, so move on to um, Miriam Cadillo joined us um, and I don't know if she managed to have a, co have a coffee already. It is five in the morning, so um, 
yeah, but uh, yeah, without further ado, and um, for those who joined a little bit later, we'll take kind of all the questions um, at the end. So wonderful, um, Miriam. Great, hi everybody. Um, just give me a moment to share my screen. Um, can everybody see my screen now? Great. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, I seriously apologize uh, for being late. I, um, I got the time screwed up, actually. Um, and obviously, I was, I was uh, sleeping until my alarm went off, but I thought it was uh, 530 here and it was actually 430. So um, really, really sorry about that. Anyway, um, I will get started. So my presentation is called From Other to Self, oh. Illegal Drug Addict. Oh, I'm here. We're, yeah. We're We've got your full screen rather than just your presentation. I think you might have to launch the presentation because we've got your text there as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I should make the, uh, sorry. Um, You're able to let me see if this is the presentation. No. Without that obscuring. Is this better? Yeah, I mean, we can see the whole thing. It's just we have your text as well. Is that? Oh, you see my text as well? We see your, yeah, we're seeing just the whole desktop, essentially. Oh, so maybe you could try starting the presentation and um, then starting the screen sharing. Here, and let's that fix it. Is this better? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. great. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> um, it uh, We've gone back to in-person teaching, so it's been a while since I've had to do this. <laughs> um, Okay, um, uh, so again, uh, the title of my presentation is From Other to Self, Illegal Drug Addicts in Japanese Imperial and Post-Imperial Fiction. Um, so the term addiction has a long and convoluted genealogy. In the 19th century, the standard usage of addiction indicated a damaging habituation to intoxicating substances, especially stigmatized or banned ones. By contrast, today the compass uh, the concept encompasses a spectrum from strong liking to pathological obsession for an almost inexhaustible range of objects in pursuit. Drugs and alcohol, of course, but also sex, gambling, exercise, work, food, the internet, etc. In contemporary parlance, addiction is a social state and moral condition largely based on public evaluation of the activity in question and its quote unquote proper role in daily life. Given the simultaneous vagueness and potency of the addiction concept, it's proven an enduring trope in literatures around the world. Critics have devoted considerable attention to the depiction of addiction to illicit substances in the Western canon, as well as in early modern and modern Chinese literature. By contrast, the portrayal of narcotics addiction in Japanese language fiction remains almost entirely unexplored. This neglect may derive in part from the mistaken but widespread belief that Japan is and always has been drug free. In fact, um, as we just heard from Judith, early 20th century Japan was the leader of a vast narcotic economy in East Asia, maintaining the highest rates of opiate trafficking and consumption in the world. Both the legal and illegal trade in opium, morphine, and heroin um, as well as other narcotics, ensnared uncounted millions and provided the financial underpinnings of imperial expansion. Owing to the significance of illegal drugs, portrayals of addicts were common in early and mid 20th century Japanese writings. In this talk, I draw from a more extensive survey of such portrayals to discuss two full length works that exemplify how conventions for depicting addiction change from the pre war to the post war period. So the first is Oshita Udaru's 1930 detective novel, Ahem Fujin, Madam Opium. Um, little is known about Oshita. He was much less famous than contemporaries in, in the genre, such as Edogawa Rampo, and has received little, if any, critical attention to date. <laughs> 
So well before the appearance of ahimfujin, injecting refined narcotics such as morphine and heroin had become far more common than opium smoking in Japan and its empire. However, Oshita and his fellow writers tended to prefer to write about smoking, which was saturated with long-standing stereotypes of degeneracy. They identified opium addiction much as their European and American contemporaries did as a problem of the racial other, generally the Chinese. So for Japan, the image of the recumbent somnambulant addict became a metonym for China itself, which was seen as incapable of self-sovereignty very conveniently for Japan's imperialist ambitions on the Asian mainland. Ahim Fujin opens in the dark, shabby office of the China Trading Company, the front organization of title character Madame Yoshimachi. Its location in central Tokyo is significant because it suggests the penetration of Chinese vice to the very heart of the Japanese polity. In the year that the novel was published, barely 30,000 Chinese lived in Japan, yet in this text and also others, um, they're castigated as contaminants within an abstinent local population. So returning to the scene, an old man badly dressed and carrying an umbrella against the afternoon drizzle knocks at the door. It's opened by Cheng, described as a, quote, yellow skinned Chinese opium addict. The visitor, who identifies himself as Tsukata, immediately asks for Madame Yoshimachi, only to be informed that she has not yet arrived. As Tsukata begs for her, Cheng can only reply helplessly, but she comes and goes as she pleases. It's useless to summon her. Finally, her dominance of both men established, Madame appears. She's a beautiful woman in her late twenties, dressed in traditional Chinese clothing. From a gilded box in her handbag, she gives Tsukata opium. As he smokes, he transforms from a tremulous old man with sallow skin and labored breath to a youth of no more than 25. Addiction to opium has aged him prematurely. In exchange for the drug, he agrees to spy for Madame Yoshimachi. Eventually, having exhausted his stash, Tsukata collapses in a seedy Chinese theater in the throes of withdrawal. His death, reported in the newspaper the next day, is said to be piteous, kawaii and his addiction is attributed to a weak character and undisciplined aspects in his nature. As a Japanese male, the author implies, he's deplorable, but not evil. As the victim of a woman and a Chinese man, Chen, he's not responsible for his actions. His death is a cautionary tale for the nation. So Madame's interaction with Scotta is purely a business transaction, but in the next scene, she uses addiction to subjugate a more intimate male acquaintance, the artist Sumashita. The two meet in a Chinese style room with green, green dragon wallpaper, illuminated only by the light of an opium lamp. As they sit in semi-darkness, Madame Yushimachi asks Sumashita why he has ceased to care for her. Sumashita cites her influence over the aforementioned Scotta, who was a university student before his degeneration at Madame's hands, a fate Sumashita himself fears. Madame argues with him, but is unable to sway him with words. Switching strategies, she prepares opium for smoking. Under his silent gaze, she inhales, intoxication suffusing her features with a wild beauty. It's good, she says softly, encouraging him. Against the combined temptation of the woman and the opium, Tsumashita is powerless. He seizes the pipe from her hands and begins the long descent into addiction, denouncing her as a poison woman, dokfu, as he nods off. In male authored literature and beyond, the poison woman rejects the prescribed role for her gender as a moral exemplar, threatening to lead innocent men like Tsukata astray and to undermine the social foundations of paternalism and decency. Her appearance is subject to minute scrutiny, but her thoughts and motives are opaque. She's interesting not as an individual in her own right, but as the embodiment of society's darkest fears, an antithesis of the image of feminine perfection embodied by the Mijian Taisho era catchphrase, good wife, wise mother, Ryosai Kimbo. Madame Yoshimachi's use of opium, both for personal consumption and to dominate men, not only transgresses society's expectations for her sex, but also for her nationality, as she, a Japanese woman, moves from her China trading company to an opium den while wearing Chinese clothes and interacting with Chinese characters. 
Though clearly identified as racially Japanese, she nonetheless embodies the covert seductiveness of China. Through Madame, Oshita suggests that deviation from the female norm transforms wives and mothers, guardians of home and national tranquility and bearers of the next generation from superior Japanese to inferior Chinese, thus threatening the survival of the Japanese race nation and the legitimacy of the empire. So the end of World War II brought about many changes in drug use and its representation. So I, I want to talk about that for the time I have remaining. Upon taking power over mainland China in 1949, the Communist Party declared the eradication of narcotics a paramount objective. Under Mao Zedong, the party object adopted a zero tolerance policy toward opiates. By 1953, the state had proclaimed itself drug free. The stereotype of the addict was no longer Chinese. Meanwhile, for Japan, the loss of the war meant the loss of the empire, the narcotics traffic that had sustained it, and even sovereignty over the home islands during the Allied occupation. Amid the difficulties of defeat, illegal drug use became increasingly salient. Beginning in 1945 and cresting in the mid-1950s was the Hiropon age, Hiropon Jidai, as it was known in its own time. So during the Hiropong age, the manufacture, traffic, and consumption of philippon, a type of methamphetamine, were leading social issues, subject to an unprecedented frenzy of state, media, medical, and community attention. In this first epidemic of methamphetamine dependence in the world, an estimated 1.5 million people out of a total population of approximately 80 million became regular users. They included some of the best known writers of the period, particularly the members of the Braiha or decadence movement. Through both art and lifestyle, the Braiha sought to express the aimlessness and lack of identity of the early post-war nation state. So the most famous member of the Braiha, Dazai Osamu, lived a brief and tormented life. Born to a wealthy family in Northern Japan, Dazai was admitted to university in Tokyo, but never achieved a degree. Instead of attending classes, he spent his college years flirting with the leftist movement and writing short stories. Meanwhile, his health deteriorated as a result of his abuse of morphine, alcohol, and other substances. Dazai probably could not have imagined writing a personal narrative of addiction during his youth, when consumption of drugs was designated as racially Chinese. However, he took up the subject in his 1948 novel, Ningen Shikaku, no longer human. This work consists of a series of notebooks in which the protagonist, Yozo, narrates the depression that consumes him. Uh, a lightly fictionalized alter ego of Dazai, Yozo is similarly tormented by a lifelong sense of self-loathing, born of the conviction that he's undeserving of his intellectual, material, and emotional gifts. He seeks refuge in alcoholism when his physical symptoms become untenable. At the suggestion of a pharmacist, pharmacist he begins a course of self-treatment with morphine. The drug initially provides relief, but then Yozo soon finds himself unable to function without him, without it. To support his illicit habit, he produces and sells pornography and begins an affair with the pharmacist. He raves, truly addiction was the furthest extent of shame. No matter what I do, it just won't work out, but simply add another layer to my humiliation. The burden of my sins will become heavier bit by bit and my sufferings will increase and intensify. All that can happen now is that one foul humiliating sin will be piled on another and my sufferings will become only the more acute. I want to die, I must die. Living itself is the source of sin. Despite his professions of ignominy, Yozo's tragedy differs from that of pre-war addict characters such as Oshita's Tsukata in lacking any suggestion that his condition is racially unseemly or unbecoming as a Japanese national. Rather, by becoming dependent on drugs, Yozo seeks to force the outside world to acknowledge what he himself has always believed, that he is not or is no longer more generally human. On the verge of killing himself, Yozo confesses his circumstances to his father, whose representatives place the youth in a sanitarium where he's cured of his addiction. Nonetheless, he feels that he's been permanently branded on the forehead with the word madman, or perhaps reject. 
Upon his release from the clinic, his family confirms this judgment by banishing him from Tokyo and sending him to live quietly several hours away with only an old servant for company till he dies. Yet others are more sympathetic. Following his demise, a bar hostess remembers the tragic youth lovingly. The yozo I knew, she says, was so easygoing and amusing. He was a good boy, an angel. Shorn of its racial baggage, addiction is represented without moral censure as the result of circumstances beyond the control of the individual. So I'm just about out of time. Um, so I'll conclude here with a brief summary of the main point of my comparison. During the imperial age, Japanese fiction writers like Oshitao Daru tended to deploy the figure of the addict to signify a threatening racial other, in this case Chinese, who were, by, the, by virtue of their use of opium, viewed as appropriate subjects of rule by Japan. After 1945, amid the defeat and dismantling of the empire and the outbreak of a narcotics crisis at home, the significance of addiction in Japanese fiction shifted to become a metaphor for a means of working through the perceived victimhood of the Japanese people themselves. Thank you very much. Um, Oleg, I think, I think we can move to you now. Um, you might have to stop sharing, I think. Okay, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. Um, oh, right. So, somewhat um, staying in Denver, I guess, here, or in Colorado, I guess. Um, start of mine, if I get my screen shared. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so, um, oops, is it as a PowerPoint? As it's not. We we okay. can see the slides on the left side. Yeah, no, okay. Well, that's what I was going okay, to see. How's that work better? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Uh, Sorry, a couple of screens going on. Um, okay, wonderful. So, um, yes, on May 11th, um, 2019, um, residents of Denver, Colorado narrowly voted in favor of a referendum that effectively decriminalized the possession of so-called magic mushrooms in the city by prohibiting law enforcement officials from spending resources to impose criminal penalties for personal use and possession. This news seemed to reflect changing attitudes towards magic mushrooms, which, like marijuana, have been increasingly studied for their potential medical benefits. Since 2019, jurisdictions in five US states and the District of Columbia have relaxed their laws against magic mushrooms. At the same time, the new American laws concerning magic mushrooms remain considerably more restrictive than Japanese laws were two decades earlier. Around the turn of the millennium, Japan was in the midst of a magic mushroom moment during which certain psychotropic plants were legally and openly sold and consumed throughout the country, leading to a national panic among certain politicians and the media. This paper examines the history of discourses around magic mushrooms in the 1990s and early 2000s. I argue that magic mushrooms fell into established patterns of popular discourse regarding drugs which ultimately led to their ban in 2002. I argue that an important aspect of the discourses on magic mushrooms was a view that they were foreign and that their use was un-Japanese. Furthermore, foreign mushroom use entered the country through the major urban areas of Tokyo and Osaka before spreading it out into the rural heartland, contributing to the perceived spiritual and physical corruption of the true Japan. And in this talk, I'll focus on these first three aspects here and um, while the below two are things I'll touch, I touch on in the larger um, chapter, and I, I won't go to depth here, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end. Now, magic mushrooms is an umbrella category that refers especially to mushrooms containing the psychoactive compounds psilocybin and psilocin, but it can include fly agaric and other species. In Japan, 13 different types of native wild magic mushrooms were identified by the Health, Welfare, uh, Health and Welfare Ministry in 2001 after several years of research. The most prominent types of native magic mushrooms in Japan are varieties of Hikagetake and Shibiratake, which are found throughout Japan from Hokkaido as far south as Okinawa. 
in spite of several existing Japanese terms for magic mushrooms, such as waraitake or odoritake, the most common label since the early 1990s is majiku mushroomu, a phonetic rendering of the English term. In 1971, the United Nations passed the Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which also included magic mushrooms. However, in light of the existing uses of psychoactive plants in traditional ceremonies, medicine, and religious practices, the convention allowed an exemption for substances that were found in wild plants um, at the discretion of national governments. Under the 1990 revision of Japan's narcotics and psychotropics control law, psychotropic plants, including magic mushrooms and the psychotropic peyote cactus were excluded, although processing these was a criminal offense. So in other words, it was legal to grow, sell, and consume peyote and psychotropic mushrooms in their natural state, but illegal to grind them into powder or otherwise extract their active ingredients. Um, for example, to sell these in capsules or other forms. Now this legal situation is very similar to um, the United Kingdom at the time, where processed, um, including dried mushrooms were banned, while fresh mushrooms were legal and openly sold until 2005. In Japan, there were related restrictions on the sale of mushrooms and peyote for consumption, and vendors would explicitly label them as for viewing and admiring purposes only, kanshoyo. Now this euphemistic description is especially amusing as there are a few things less aesthetically pleasing than dried and shriveled pale gray magic mushrooms. Now magic mushrooms were the most prominent of the legal psychotropic substances in Japan for reasons of cost, availability, and intensity. One gram of dried magic mushrooms, which is typically sufficient for an experience that lasted several hours, typically cost roughly three to 4,000 yen, or about 25 to 30 US dollars. The most widely used magic mushrooms are those containing psilocybin, psilocybin and trace amounts of psilocin, and these are typically ingested either fresh or dried and often made into tea or added to miso soup in Japan. Effects include heightened sensory experiences, hallucinations, feelings of detachment, and impaired judgment that normally last four to six hours. Research has shown that there's no realistic fatal dosage for psilocybin or psilocin in humans, and that there are no lasting physical effects from their use. Recent research increasingly suggests the potential of magic mushrooms for the treatment of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other conditions. At the same time, due to their psychoactive effects, psilocybin and psilocin may trigger negative thoughts and existing psychological trauma. And with these considerations in mind, this talk considers some of the events and discourses during and after the magic mushroom moment that lasted from roughly 1997 to 2002. Now, very few people in Japan were familiar with magic mushrooms in the early 1990s. Encounters with magic mushrooms were essentially limited to some rural areas in Japan where magic mushrooms grew wild, as well as travelers off the beaten path to Southeast Asia and the Americas. Even in rural Japan, knowledge of psychotropic plants was not necessarily shared, as a 1991 incident in Okinawa reveals. In July of that year, a family of three males, an adult and two children, sought medical attention after consuming a Paneolus papil papilionaceous mushroom. The Latin names for mushrooms are always killing me, but this incident occasioned a medical report by the prefectural authorities describing their condition. The symptoms reported by all three family members were numbness and sudden laughter, with the 11 and 12 year old children reporting no other symptoms. They had consumed one mushroom each and their symptoms lasted roughly 80 minutes, ceasing two hours after they had consumed the mushroom. In contrast, the 34 year old adult had consumed 15 to 20 mushrooms and his symptoms only disappeared 12 hours later. In addition to the numbness and laughter, the adult also report, reported feeling paralyzed and some difficulty breathing for which he was hospitalized. According to the report, he was so relaxed that he forgot to breathe, but there was no mention of medical intervention. The adult also reported hallucinating, seeing bodies of light and geometric figures, as well as imagining that he was being eaten by a fish and fighting in the Gulf War. Now, a report assembled by the same prefectural health authorities in 2012 reveals that this remained the only reported medical case of someone consuming a wild psychotropic mushroom in Okinawa up to that point. At the same time, the 2012 report indicated that Okinawa had long been a place where foreigners would harvest, harvest psychotropic mushrooms in order to become intoxicated. This no doubt referred primarily to US military personnel who would have been familiar with magic mushroom types from back home and were well aware of Japan's permissive laws in this regard. 
Tellingly, the United States Marine Corps at Iwakuni informed its personnel when the laws regarding magic mushrooms were changed in June 2002. The connections between foreigners, foreignness, and magic mushrooms were an intrinsic part of Japan's magic mushroom moment, and many Japanese indeed first encountered magic mushrooms abroad. While roughly 5 million Japanese of all ages traveled overseas in 1985, by 2000, this number had more than tripled to a high of roughly 17 million. The trend was especially pronounced among Japanese in their 20s, almost 25% of whom went abroad in 1996. These young travelers often had new types of encounters with locals and other tourists, which included exposure to drugs and other alternative activities and became the cause of some official concern back in Japan. An August 1992 report in the Asahi Shimbun recorded that six young Japanese males had already received consular assistance in Thailand that year after incidents involving magic mushrooms. In one case, when an embassy official was called to a Bangkok police station, he found a 22-year-old Japanese student covered in mud wearing only shorts with no passport or belongings. He had allegedly put a coin in his ear and said he was using it to receive signals. The embassy contacted his father and older brother who came from Japan to take the young man back a few days later. This incident and others were blamed on magic mushrooms, which were widely available in popular backpack destinations that boasted modern hotels, but also many Western hippies. Obe no hippie mo oi. By 1996, commenting on the growth of party culture among Western and Japanese tourists in Thailand and elsewhere, the Mainichi Shimbun observed a spread beyond mushrooms and marijuana to MDMA, LSD, and heroin citing police concerns that returning travelers who experienced drugs abroad were fueling demand in Japan. According to the Mainichi, quote, the penetration of narcotics was beginning to eat away the soul, kokoro, and body karara of the Japanese people, reflecting the widespread view that drugs were un-Japanese and the result of harmful foreign influences. Along with Japanese travelers, foreigners in Japan were also seen as an influence behind the popularization of magic mushrooms as they were widely available in Ropongi and other areas frequented by foreigners. The, foreigners of, the foreignness of drugs was embodied in the use of the foreign loan word magiku mushroomu, which referred both to actual psychotropic mushrooms and was also used as a marketing device for herbal ecstasy, natural LSD, and other so-called legal highs that proliferated in Japan and the West in the mid-1990s as alternatives to popular illegal drugs. In Japan, these legal highs might also contain actual psychotropic mushroom powder, although this processing stage then made them illegal. And a Nagoya businessman charged with selling capsules of mushroom powder in November 1998 was the first person to be arrested in relation to mushroom sales in Japan. Now, public controversy regarding magic mushrooms developed slowly. By 1997, magic mushrooms and grow kits were widely sold in areas like Shinjuku and Shibuya, According to the Narcotics Division of the Ministry of Health and Welfare at the time, the mushrooms themselves, quote, do not have much active content, and domestically, no incidents of abuse or addiction have been reported, end of quote. The ministry evidently did not have any evidence-based reasons to intervene at this point. By 2002, however, views had changed to the point that politicians voted to ban magic mushrooms completely. In the intervening five years, magic mushrooms came to be viewed as a serious social problem blamed for youth delinquency, violence, and suicide, even if the evidence for these developments was often lacking. During the magic mushroom moment, many newspaper reports focused on incidents involving bodily harm. The following year saw a spate of reports on magic mushrooms, with the Asahi Shimbun writing that, quote, magic mushroom related incidents or accidents and other trouble concerning young people are increasing. According to the Asahi, quote, there are reports that a man in the Kanto area fell from the ninth floor and died after taking mushroom powder. While a 40 year old man was seriously injured by jumping from his second floor window after taking mushroom powder and thinking, I can fly. Although there is evidence that neither of these incidents actually involved magic mushrooms, they contributed to one of the most sensational and popular tropes about magic mushrooms, that they caused people to jump off tall buildings. Other ways of framing articles on magic mushrooms reinforced the idea that they were dangerous substances. One of these was stressing their foreignness, with the Asahi Shimbun writing that the salespeople are importing most of these products from abroad. Official information from government agencies was um, and remains measured. 
The current Japan Poisoned Information Center website contains only one line about magic mushrooms containing psilocybin, stating that, quote, hallucinations decrease after two hours and the condition returns largely to normal within four to 12 hours. A four page information sheet um, about psilocybin mushrooms issued by the Japan Inf Poison Information Center is even more explicit, stating that these mushrooms are not considered lethal at all and have no lasting effects. The supposed danger from magic mushrooms highlighted by the media went beyond their supposed impact on health. Mushrooms also became a subject of fears concerning the corrupting influence of mass urbanization and the decay of youth culture. Tokyo and Osaka were seen as the hubs of magic mushroom culture in Japan, as the hubs where these entered the country from overseas. Within Tokyo, mushrooms were associated especially with Shinjuku, Shibuya, and Harajuku, while in Osaka they were associated with Amerikamura. The fact that magic mushrooms were often sold by a mail order also raised concerns, as this method could bring these corrupting influences to the most distant corners of Japan that represented the innocent heartland. The media discourses on Japanese are on magic mushrooms had a powerful effect on politicians in the national diet, ultimately exceeding the influence of experts such as the researchers at the JPIC. One of the most vocal figures concerning magic mushrooms was the former journalist and new Komeito representative Tabata Masahiro. In a February 1997 meeting, Tabata challenged the government's action or inaction on the drug epidemic that was supposedly sweeping Japan. Tabata stated that there was an explosion in amphetamine use among high school students, presenting statistics of marijuana and cocaine use in American high schools as a warning to Japan. Tabata's focus was on the sale of plant drugs in Shibuya and Shinjuku, as well as online via email. He stated that drug pollution was recently spreading in his hometown of Osaka, with numbers of drug people increasing in spite of police efforts. He claimed that malevolent foreigners, especially Iranians, were selling things in Amerikamura and contributing to the pollution of Osaka's youth. For Tabata, violent gangs and foreigners were two of the major problems in Osaka. Tabata brought together many of the talking points from the media regarding magic mushrooms, conflating them with illegal drugs, while at the same time portraying them as a gateway to more dangerous substances. He also focused on various foreign aspects of magic mushrooms, such as Japanese travelers first encountering them abroad. Officials from various government agencies responded to Tabata that they were investigating mushrooms and gathering further evidence about them before deciding on any recommended changes in policy. In spite of the efforts of Tabata and other politicians and sensationalist reports in the media, the lack of evidence of harm caused by mushrooms kept the bureaucracy from acting quickly. On January 22, 2002, the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Labor announced that it was proceeding to ban magic mushrooms within the year which ultimately happened in June. They would be added to the list of restricted psychotropic plants, which also included coca and opium poppies. By associating mushrooms with cocaine and opiates, as well as pointing out that magic mushrooms were already illegal in the United States, this announcement evaded the political reasons behind their ban. The fact that the announcement regarding the proposed ban was made almost six full months before the new legislation came into force and a public comment period was at least nominally implemented in March, strongly indicate that there did not seem to be a great urgency to act for reasons of public safety or health. The weeks and months following the ban on magic mushrooms were marked by sporadic arrests for their possession and use. Most cases involved individuals who had contact with authorities for incidental reasons. Given the number of grow kits and magic mushrooms for sale in early 2002, and the small and steadily declining number of arrests in 2003, it seems that many mushroom users may have stockpiled before the ban and gradually used up their supplies. Now, as this paper has discussed, the magic mushroom moment was heavily impacted by sensationalist media discourses that contributed significantly to the complete ban on mushrooms in 2002. Perhaps more than in cases of other drugs, the gap between demonstrable and perceived harm to individuals and society was substantial. This gap was embodied by magic mushroom users and scientific researchers on one side and politicians and the national news media on the other. Magic mushrooms were linked to sensational tropes such as causing people to jump from buildings or commit violent crimes and were vilified as gateways to drug use and other illegal activities, even though there was often little or no evidence to support these claims. <laughs> 
Many tragic incidents might conversely have been partially enabled by the negative attitudes towards mushrooms as people sought out other, potentially more dangerous, legal highs. The tensions between evidence-based researchers and media-sensitive politicians were apparent in the long process of implementing the magic mushroom ban. Although more than a dozen species are known to grow wild in Japan, magic mushrooms were portrayed as foreign elements that were corrupting the nation's youth, from the urban centers to the rural heartland. Official wariness of foreign influences continues to be prominent in government warnings to Japanese travelers to North America and other regions where marijuana is legal, that they would still be breaking Japanese law if they consume it overseas. Certainly, foreigners and foreign experiences contributed significantly to the development of the magic mushroom moment, but they have long been known in Japan, and researchers there have been responsible for significant breakthroughs in our understanding of these fungi. Ultimately, the magic mushroom moment reflects broader trends and approaches to drugs and legalization in Japan and elsewhere, and the tensions that exist between different factions and interests. Uh, thank you. <laughs>